Emma, I must reveal my soul to you. I feel that my end is coming soon. You should know the truth, even if you hate me, she began, squeezing Emma's hand. When she managed to become Emma, the woman did not understand. Usually, she was, to her mother-in-law, a snake in the pit, a witch. What was not only, in general, and then suddenly, Emma. Although, it's true what people say. On his deathbed, a person changes and begins to realize his mistakes. That's probably what happened to Charlotte. Emma worked as a nurse at the hospital where her former mother-in-law was admitted with a heart attack. To judge how severe the situation was, the woman could not, but she was not a doctor. But there was talk that nothing good could come of it. Emma never met her ex-husband. Either he did not come to visit his mother, or they were lucky not to cross paths in the corridor. And while they had nothing to talk about at all, he had hurt Emma badly in his time. He had hurt her so badly that she didn't want to see him. Everything happened when her due date came. Her husband wasn't too happy about the idea of having a baby. He grumbled that they had not had the time to get back on their feet, and now he would have to work alone to raise the family. Emma promised that she would think of something. Maybe she could find some part-time work at home. When Emma came to the hospital, they decided to make her a cesarean, although there were no indications for that. The woman tried to call her mother-in-law as she worked as the head of the maternity department. Emma wanted her to intercede for her because there were no indications. No one was going to do her cesarean earlier. She was afraid that it would be bad for the baby and for her, but no one would listen and her mother-in-law would not answer the phone. And when Emma came out of anesthesia, she was told that the girl was already dead in the womb. It was the worst news Emma had ever received in her life. Some part of herself died that day. The relationship with her husband had gone downhill since that moment. Emma didn't want to see him, and he blamed it on her for managing to keep the baby. Her mother-in-law, too, poured her share of oil on the fire, and it ended in divorce. A divorce that her husband blamed on her, Emma. And now, Charlotte was lying in the hospital where Emma got a job as a nurse and needed care. And her son was not with her, as well as his new wife. Most likely, the woman was left unwanted by her family. Don't talk nonsense. You will definitely get better, Emma tried to console her former mother-in-law. But she just brushed it off. Nothing will be good. You know that. But you're a good woman. I wish I could have seen it right away. You should know, Emma that they did not just make you a C-section. Her heart skipped a beat. Emma, of course, guessed that it was for a reason, but it was still hard to hear it with her own ears. And your baby didn't die. They switched it to a stillborn, and your child, my granddaughter, your daughter, was given up for adoption to a rich family. Her ears began to whistle so hard she wanted to scream. Her legs instantly weakened, and Emma struggled to stay on them. She looked at her mother-in-law and saw not an infirm, weakened woman, but a monster. The very real monster that had made her suffer, deprived her of happiness. Why? Emma asked in a deaf voice. He didn't want children, you knew that. He had not yet risen on his own feet, he had shown great promise. Yes, you know that he has probably achieved a lot now. A child would have prevented him. He was afraid you'd start claiming alimony if he decided to get a divorce that you'd get on his nerves. And he had work to do. He talked me into getting rid of the baby, to give it up and convince you that the baby was dead. Think about it. I would have done anything for my son, as long as he was successful. But it's scary to look death in the eye and go to the next world with such a burden. Can you forgive me for this guilt? How could you? Emma whispered. She did not know what to do, how to be, what to say. Thoughts were lost in her head. Tears flowed down her cheeks. Where, where is my daughter? Emma asked, choking on her own pain. I have a notebook in my nightstand. There's an address on the first page. But there is nothing you can do. He is a very serious man, very powerful. He won't give you his daughter. We'll see about that, Emma muttered, and with trembling hands began to look for the notebook. She found it, tore out a sheet with the address, and hurried out. Emma, forgive me, Charlotte in a husky voice addressed to the woman. God will forgive. Emma no longer wanted to be near the man who had done this to her, ripped out her part of the soul and trampled on it. Also, there was only one wish pulsating in her head, to see her daughter as soon as possible. 
It had been five and a half years. She was so grown up. Alive. Tears streamed down her cheeks. Emma ran into the office of her supervisor and announced that she had to leave. She did not remember how she got to the address, but standing at the gate of a huge mansion, she knew that just to get the child will not work. Slowly, she began to realize that it would be a blow to the child as well, because her daughter was already used to another mother. Well, at least to see her in person. A man met Emma on the porch of the mansion. He was well himself, but his eyes read emptiness. Somewhere in the courtyard came children singing, and her heart was torn, stretched there, to her daughter. Are you here for a job as a nanny? the man asked. Nanny? Emma asked again, looking at the child's voice. Didn't you? the stranger was surprised. Sergey? Emma asked, and the man nodded. I have not come to hire a nanny, but to fetch my daughter. Sergey, instantly pale, the cheeks on his face began to move. He looked at Emma as if he wanted to crush her, but she wasn't about to back down. This is not a simple story. Listen to me, please. Emma began to cry and tell the man about what had happened to her, about how the closest person, her husband, had talked his mother into getting rid of the child. I didn't know. I didn't know my daughter was alive. I thought to the last minute that she was gone. I was so afraid. And now... I won't give you my daughter, the man shook his head. She is all I have. Isabella is my life. Isabella, Emma began to cry even harder, because that was exactly what she wanted to call her daughter. She could hardly stand on her feet anymore. She did not know what to do next. And Sergei could have kicked her out, called the guards or the police, but he kept listening. Come inside. I'll make you some tea and tell you my story. Emma began to nod, though her heart ached to see where her daughter was. Once inside the house, Emma realized with sadness that she could not give her daughter the same luxury. She could not give her everything she had now. Would the little girl be happy with her in her shabby apartment? Sure, she would give her daughter all she had, but would it be enough? Out of the corner of her eye, Emma noticed the cheek doll palaces. It was most likely Isabella's playroom in that room. Walking into the kitchen and sitting down at the table, Emma began to listen to the story of the master of the house. My wife was infertile. We dreamed of having a child, and then we got a call from the maternity hospital and were told that there was a healthy little girl who was abandoned by her mother. We didn't even think about it. We started the paperwork right away, and our house was filled with happiness. We became parents. When Isabella was three years old, my wife died of a heart attack. It was a great loss. I still can hardly comprehend it, even though two and a half years have passed. And Isabella is always asking when Mommy will come back to her from heaven. It really hurts. She is waiting for her mother, but not for you. Emma's heart was cutting, tearing to shreds. Emma put down the glass of tea Sergei had poured for her and got to her feet. She saw the little girl through the frosted glass of the kitchen, and her heart clutched in her chest. It was her, her little girl, her copy. Emma wanted to rush to her, but held on to the fact that she could not shock the child. Isabella loves her father, after all. You said you needed a nanny, Emma said in a resolute tone. Nanny, but not you. You cannot control your temper and your emotions. I can't trust you if you decide to kidnap the child. Kidnap? No, I swear to you, no. I came here wanting my daughter, but now I know she has a life of her own. I can't ruin a child's psyche. I beg you, let me be near her. Please let me be her nanny. I will give you an answer in two days, dryly mouthed the man. All this time, Emma's heart was breaking. She was ready to go crazy. How she wanted to hug her baby, to talk to her, to look into her eyes. It took a great effort to keep herself in control and not go to the police, not to start to demand the return of the child. Two days later, Sergei called back and said that he was ready to make concessions, that he had gotten through to Emma, and if she would sign an agreement according to which she would not dare tell Isabella that she was her mother, and if she would get a psychologist's counseling and a DNA test, he would agree to hire her as a nanny. Emma agreed to everything. Without the analysis, it was clear that Isabella was her daughter. She was her little copy. But it was important for Sergei to comply with all the formalities. He wanted to make sure that she was really the mother. When the tests were ready and the psychologist agreed that the woman could hold her own, 
Sergei handed Emma the contract, and she, without reading it, put all the necessary signatures. On the same day, the man introduced his daughter to the new nanny. That day was the happiest day in Emma's life. At first, the man let her work two hours and two days, and after a month insisted that Emma should quit the hospital and move in with them. You will always be with Isabella. She is very sympathetic to you, he said. Emma did not even want to be paid for babysitting, but Sergei insisted and constantly referred to the contract. She cleaned the house, cooked breakfast, lunch, dinner, and laundry, and spent a lot of time with Isabella. I wanted so much to call her little girl and hold her close to me, but I could not. Eight months passed. Sergei slowly thawed out. He understood that Emma will not take the child away from him, and his heart began to reach out to this caring woman over whom fate has played a cruel joke. He began to communicate with Emma more and more often and invited her for a walk in the garden. They had many common interests and many topics that could be discussed. Slowly, Sergei opened his heart to Emma, except that he had no idea how she would react to his warm feelings. It was Emma's birthday. All day, Sergei acted as if he did not know anything. And in the evening, he and Isabella arranged a surprise for the woman. They invited her to tea with cake, and Isabella gave the woman a small box with a bow. Daddy told me the truth, said Isabella, hiding her eyes. You are my mommy, who came down to us from heaven. Emma gasped at the sensations that overwhelmed her overnight, tears streaming down her cheeks. She looked at Sergei, who smiled at the corners of his lips. But mom and dad have to be married, don't they? Daddy wants to marry you. Will you agree, mommy? Emma was sobbing. She cradled her daughter in her arms, breathing in the scent of a relative, kissing her and cradling her again. I love you. Thank you for coming down to us, smiled Isabella. But you did not say whether you will marry my father. Isabella, Sergei shushed. Marrying my daddy. We've rehearsed several times. Emma laughed, and everyone picked up on her laughter. I will, of course, I will, she smiled, continuing to hug her daughter. And Sergei joined them and hugged his princesses.